Welcome to the Third Round Picks Podcast. With me today is Adam Bibbs uh, on Twitter, Mike Bibbins, and guest guest starring is Lock Draft Dougie uh, at Lock Draft and uh, at Lock Draft Dougie on Twitter as well. Yo yo, how y'all doing today? Oh, I'm hot. Santa came to my house today, dropped some stuff off for my son. Um, watching a little. Uh, Mavericks Warriors last night. Uh, it, it's cool that I'm in Arizona right now, so it comes on a little bit earlier. Normally, I watch those games at like six in the morning, so I, I, I actually get to finish it out at night. That's pretty great. Uh, Bibbs, how you doing? Uh, my wallet could be doing a little bit better. Uh, Merry Christmas. But um, other than that, I'm pretty good. Pretty good. How, how are you today, Max? Uh, well, this podcast setup has been a little wonky, but we got it all going good, and now I'm just ready to get this rolling. Sure must go on. Indeed. So, to start off today, we are going to hit up on the new big risers this year, Tennessee coming over to take over the college basketball landscape this season. A lot of jack dudes on their squad, Admiral Schofield, Grant Williams, East Ponds, uh, even Kyle Alexander. Biz, why don't you start? I know you have some hot takes about Admiral Schofield. Uh, yeah, so um, over the years, I haven't really paid much attention to Admiral Schofield, but coming into this season, Tennessee is on a hot streak. Um, I was definitely glad to check in on Gonzaga versus Tennessee, and uh, it feels like in the games I've watched Tennessee play this year, they kind of have a formula where Grant Williams does most of the damage in the first half. And then Admiral takes over in the second. Um, and you look at him, you see he's physically jacked. So he's one of those guys who's not going to have any problem dealing with the physicality coming straight in. Uh, but his shot is the real deal. Uh, this year he's shooting 42% from three, I believe, last time I checked. Uh, he shot 39% the past two seasons. So his shot is legit. He has a very high release. Um, he has a little bit of a post game, which is good for a big guard. So uh, I think that Tennessee system where he kind of plays inside a good bit, it really hides how good he really is. I think he's a guy that right now I think he's projected as a mid-second round type. But um, when he starts getting in workouts versus some of these guys, I think uh, he, he could be a quick riser to sneak into the first round. Yeah, he's got a lot of shot diversity and just being that strong, being able to bang inside and being able to space the floor really consistently. His form is pretty sweet, steps into his shot, pretty high arc, makes it very difficult to contest just due to his size. Uh, it's pretty awesome to watch. Uh, Dougie, how are you feeling about Schofield? You know what? So I was looking through my rankings of my preseason board that uh, it uh, – it's not really open to the public yet, but that's the preseason board. When I come out later, I'll come out. I, I, I do four 500 player boards a year. So the the second round of it's going to be coming around. And so preseason, I had Grant Williams at 61. These are all, these are all draft eligible players, anyone who's draft eligible. So uh, I had him at 61 and I had Schofield at 95, but after watching Schofield, I watched the Kansas game also, which was they didn't, you know, they didn't pull it off, but he was impressive there. He could, he is a guy that you can look at and he belongs. He, I mean, he's going to be not going to have problems banging around physically with guys with the style of play he has. And he looks a lot more consistent on the perimeter. Um, I, he's going to raise up in my next board. I have been 95 preseason, but um, and I think Grant Williams is kind of staying in that same place around 60. Um, that when I say 61, that that you can usually rise in about 15 or 20 spots because there's going to be guys that don't come out or whatever for some whatever reason. But um, Grant Williams, that they play well together, and that's a hell of a thing to have to defend pick and roll. Jeez. They're monsters in the pick and roll. They run it with each other. Yeah, for right. sure. I was going to say, um, what I did want to go back and add about uh, Admiral as far as his potential to rise. Uh, besides what he does on the court, just his uh, personality, 
and the fact that he's a coach's player, um, one of the things I was most impressed with after the Gonzaga game when they interviewed him, uh, they asked him, you know, what he wanted to accomplish in coming back. And uh, he said his number one thing was to be his coach's favorite player when it's over. Uh, and I guess the only thing he really wants to get out of the season is to be his coach's favorite player ever. And, uh, I mean, the guys, I mean, he's going to be a workout warrior, obviously, but he's going to be a guy that a coach is going to fall in love with. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate just the way Schofield just has a lot of versatility to his game. Is very, I guess you would say, it's very mature, and you know that that versatility really makes it difficult for him to be guarded by pretty much anybody because you need to have this perfect combination of strength and length and you know physicality and intensity to be able to guard a guy that's going to go at you every single time, but can still pull up for three from NBA range and really be a hassle to deal with. Uh, my main thing with Schofield I'd like to see is that sometimes it feels like the defense isn't quite like it's, it's all right. But when I'm watching Grant Williams, that's the main separator with, for me and him is just, he always has like his arms up. He's cutting off angles most of the time, if not all the time he's contesting like every single shot, no matter what, except for like very random examples where it seems like it's strange and it kind of was weird to me when he didn't contest it. But all in all, Schofield's definitely their intriguing prospect and he definitely has my attention. Grant Williams ranks real high on the Draymondometer. Everybody's always looking for the next Draymond. Grant Williams ranks like pretty high. I would give him probably like a seven and a half on the Draymondometer. How tall is Grant Williams? Six six. six, That's six. A, yeah. Uh, let me look at projected wing. I could tell you. Oh, six seven, two forty five with projected six ten wing. I think and eight eight standing reach. Okay. I was kind of wondering because he, he seems smaller than he is sometimes. Yeah, he does. He, yeah, he looks like he could almost even be 6'5 sometimes, right? And then you got right. Admiral that's, out there next to him. That's probably what it is. <laughs> so, that's, so that was why I was looking at him, like trying to project him as a wing, and I didn't really – that yeah. that would be my concern is if he was smaller than that. But if he's 6'7", six, 6'8", six, he might be able to pull off to get a, a four. That's yeah, that's yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Also, I will, uh, one thing, uh, other thing I'd like to say about Schofield is what I call it Montrez Harrowing. There was during Montrez Harrell's senior season, like everybody told him he needed to come back with a jump shot, and so he was shooting. He, he was shooting jumpers all time, trying to prove he was he could hit the three, and he and he stopped attacking the basket. I like how Admiral Schofield has kind of integrated his game kind of on pace. I don't know. I don't know a better way to say it, but like kind of paced his integration of his outside game. Cause he could really just beast on you all the time if he wanted to, but he's trying to improve his outside game. And, right. and, and like, like, but he still knows he can like, when he really needs a bucket, he could go beast on whoever's guarding him probably. So he, I mean, he's not out there jacking out 5 million threes. Yeah, not every game. There's some games where he's tracking a lot of threes, yeah. but they're they're good shots. They're not yeah. and they're not nothing bad. I wouldn't want anything else other than for him to take it, especially with this farm. He he makes it pretty well most of the time, so I'm not about to stop him. Yeah, and he but it doesn't look forced, is it? What what I'm saying? Oh yeah, exactly what I'm saying. It doesn't look forced to me. It just looks like it. I mean, all the all the numbers are going to be distorted. They're going to keep getting more and more distorted, but. It, I mean, it just it doesn't look like it's forced. He looks like when he sees the matchup where he's going to beast on somebody, he's going to beast on him. And if the matchup dictates that he's got an open jumper with no contest on it, then that's what he's going to do. So, yeah, I'm, yeah. That, I, I just wanted to say that really quick because a lot of people, I, I, I always call it Montrez harrowing. There's a lot of people do it as they go up in classes and think they have to prove something since they're not a one and done. So, Yeah, for sure. Um, unless anyone has anything else to say about uh, Admiral Schofield, uh, perhaps about like his driving ability or anything, which I'd say a lot of it is like l bullying his way to the rim and like, you know, having some decent fluidity and then 
falling his way in as he gets, as he has a little advantage just to push his way inside and get there mm-hmm. even quicker than if he just tried to dribble his way in and then try to finish through content, which works out a lot of the time, which is with how strong he is. Well, I mean, if, he, if he's uh, if he's a playing guard in the NBA and he gets switched on Steph Curry, he could do that to Steph Curry <laughs> all day. Like, you know, so it, it's not like he's going to be some guys come out of college and they're they're they were good athletes in college. Like, I mean, or whatever they were dominant at something like the, Admiral Schofield is dominantly physically imposing guard. Right. There's nobody more. Right. Yeah. So like it, it's not going to be a almost like Zion is to guards or to to like forwards combo forwards. He is to kind of combo guard, shooting guard, whatever wing, whatever you want to make him. Yeah, I'd say wing probably just with you know? his size. Yeah, but if he's playing a guard spot, I mean, he's gonna have guys. A lot of guys are playing two two point guards, so. Yeah, he yeah. can definitely take advantage of a lot of switches. Yeah. And he has yeah. enough fluidity. I'd say that if he gets matched up versus a slower footed big, he can take him to task as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could get all all slow footed bigs, and he could he could even bully big some of these bigs that consider themselves big. He probably outweighs a lot of centers. I'd like to look at that. How many centers does uh, Admiral Schofield outweigh? Yeah, it's I mean, good he could probably him. start on a, on a defensive line right now. Speaking yeah. Of like, oh, <laughs> man, yeah. He would make – he's look like Khalil Mack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All Grant right. Williams, I don't know what Grant Williams would be. Tight end, I guess. I guess Whatever. they could both either do it. Yeah. Same All thing. Right. Good transition to Grant Williams. I'm going to let you go first, Dougie. How do you feel about Grant Williams? Um, I feel that um, he's going to get drafted because it looks like Tennessee is pretty – I mean, they're either going to win it. I, mean, I, I have not watched enough Kentucky to decide if they're good enough to be at Tennessee's level in the SEC. But um, – I mean, they're obviously good enough to win the league. So when you win the league, you get that. He's going to be first-team All-American, probably second. What You know, um, their their season kind of is is laid out in front of them already. So um, those kind of guys usually tend to get drafted in the mid-round, mid to, mid to late second round. Or even, I mean, I, I, I couldn't see him crawling into the first round unless – they make some sort of like final four run, you know, and then that that's a lazy thing that scouts always do, but they do do it. Um, Even Tenzo? Yeah. So I said, I mean, early second round is his ceiling unless they go to the final four is what I would say, but he'd be very deserving in the second round. I mean, he's, he's been out there proving it for a long time and he's got skill. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, his his uh, passing and just how he always he does a pretty good job of not making like a terrible read and keeping the ball low, like on a post feed down to the other side or swinging it over the defense, like cross court or like down to the inside for an easy layup or down yeah. from the post to an open corner man, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I would say like they don't have big to big passing besides uh what's his name alexander right there's uh, oh, yeah. the only other really big they have but but he makes like big to big passes to like schofield but i imagine that in in the nba he'll be able to make big to big passing he'll, he'll be a very good big big to big passer when he oh, has yeah. another competent big to throw to because he loves to play out of the elbow in the high post. And, and that, I mean, they could do a lot of good stuff with that. That's why he rates very high on the Draymond no meter. Yeah, I think uh, the Mavericks <laughs> often put DeAndre Jordan at sort of top of the key initiating role, trying to get him to feed inside to cutters. And I think uh, Williams could actually do a really great job at it, whereas DeAndre, it's kind of iffy on whether or not it's going to work out that night. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said, I had him, I had him, uh, rank 61, which is about as, 
as late first round, early second round as it gets, you know, like that's that's the it's the cutoff line really. So I wonder why I have ranked around him. Oh, I gotta move him ahead of James Thompson the fourth. Oh, that was a that was an early season sleeper of mine. So <laughs> he's definitely got to go above him. So all right, so but yeah, yeah, they, but like that that'll be the kind of gradual grow you'll see in his in his draft stock really. Um, is he'll gradually grow through guys like that who were kind of early season sleeper sensations. And, you know, you know Grant Williams is going to do it on the court with his numbers and his play. So, um, you know, he'll crawl over guys that, you know, people watch YouTube videos of all summer and they thought it was good. But then, you know, they come out and they average nine points and turn the ball over. So, you know get blown out and James Thompson, the fourth case get blown out by Duke by like 70 points. So, yeah. All right, Bibbs, how you feel about Grant? <laughs> so, uh, coming in, I felt a little bit worse about him because I thought he was six, five, <laughs> but, um, yes, if I'm looking at him as a wing, I, I'd be concerned about his projection because he doesn't really shoot three. Um, his mid-range game is great. Like 15 feet and in, he's he's amazing. He's got a, a nice post game and a, a post fadeaway. Uh, but when you look at him as six seven six eight, and you start grading him against a Draymond, then you see the potential for him to be a guy, if he goes to the right place, that can can really carve out a niche for himself. Um, you guys kind of mentioned his passing and stuff like that already. Uh, he's a great defender, uh, great length and extension on like blocks and deflections. Um, but his passing is what really makes him kind of stand out for me. Uh, the post feeds you mentioned, he doesn't really have another big man to feed, but, uh, his post feeds are amazing. Like he's bending the ball around people, things like that on the top. Uh, I'm, I'm really, ex- I, I like him as a player. I think he's smart. He does everything right. It's just, uh, making sure he goes to a place where his style is going to fit with his, his size. Yeah. I, I, I could piggyback on that, and I want to say that, like, going to a place, I wouldn't be surprised to see the team that takes him, whichever. I don't know if Dallas has a reputation for this around the league or not at all, but, like, as if a, if a team needs a guy to, to be kind of a dirty work guy, also, you know, he, he mixes it up, he rebounds, he's built like a brick poop house, you know, right. like, it, like, so if, if, a team feels like uh, is that is that a uh, is softness kind of anything that is that people have been i'm not talking about you guys really but in general is that something that gets lobbed on the map some i know it used to in the back in the dirt like heyday but you know it got backed up by eric dampier <laughs> we're not going to talk about that <laughs> see i come on i come on the maverick podcast ready <laughs> here, here. Anyway, but I, I I I just wanted to say that because that's what that's kind of what you're looking for in a late second round pick too, is somebody that's going to do not you know they they got to come in and prove themselves. So and Grant Williams is not afraid to do that. He's not going to back down. He's got he's he's a he's really strong willed and that it's some of the traits that people can't really measure through analytics so i like that i like if you have a team out there anybody nicks possibly people think you're soft grant williams not a bad guy to have yeah for sure uh moving on to the third of the uh tennessee quote-unquote big three uh east ponds um if you want me to go first um yeah um i'm not really big on eaves um I mean, maybe down the line. I don't know. But um, hold on one second. Um, I'm trying to get his numbers. But, I mean, on that team, he's just going to have to wait it out. What? Ah. Oh, yeah. So he's just going to have to wait it out and, and you know, let Schofield and uh, – 
Grant Williams, sorry, I'm thinking about the teams we're talking about already. Um, he's going to have to just, you know, chill, and then he'll be the man one day. But, I mean, that's their team now. Eve Times kind of, I mean, he, he I, it's really, really too early to make a projection on him. He's not anything that I'm interested in really right now. I, I don't even think I have him ranked in the top 200. To be honest, I'm, I mean, I don't. I, I, it's nothing personal against Steve Pons, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. For me, you like him? I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you like I him? I don't like like him, like him, but just like I like some <laughs> of the things about him. Yeah, I don't think he's like a this year type of guy, but he has a solid foundation that if it gets developed can really provide some, uh, some, uh, action at the NBA level, just the athleticism leaping, uh, the, he has, he looks like a lot of possessions. He's pretty intense on defense, waving his arms around harassing ball handlers, denying like handoffs and stuff. And that really made me happy. Yeah. My one thing is that his jumper is obviously very much a work in progress, but yeah. I do like how at least he's willing to take them, which is a major improvement from last year. So it's a start. So sorry, I, I was just making sure I, I had his eligibility right. Yeah, he's a freshman. So um, yeah, like he's he's somebody you should keep on your on your radar for the future, perhaps a long way down the line, but just long project is these times. Like I said, but he's he's got a good foundation in place to where there I mean, he's learned it under Grant Williams pretty much. So, you know, that's not bad. And I mean, he he's a prospect that you gotta wait. He's got he's got the physical tools, that's for gosh darn sure. Yeah, uh, quick note, Pons is a sophomore. Oh, he is a sophomore? Yeah, yeah, but either way, I mean, yeah, he's a long-term projection. I don't think – for him to come out, for – for to think that he's going to come out, barring again, like what, like I said, like them making a national championship run and like sweeping through the SEC and him being gangbusters for the rest of the season with stats, you know, I, I, I don't even think he tries right now. And then we could really see on him – in the future, yeah, and and obviously developing a jumper is his thing that he needs to do. Yeah, he that or develop uh, play at that size through. without being able to be a uh, very be above average. Uh, Bibs, you back? No, no, yeah, but I mean that that's what it really comes down to with him, and he that's something that you got to get together because. When I've seen him play, I've, I've watched Tennessee like four times. They're four big games. And I see a, a, a nice project player, but a nice project player. I'm not, I, I don't want to use it as a pejorative. But oh, yeah, he, he's definitely a foundation just needs to be improved upon. Right, yeah. And I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going through eligibility right now, but I'm not sure what Jordan Bone is. But it, it, a lot of that... It would be it would benefit them to have those guys back, um, but you know, Bowden, I'm sure he's got some partners coming back, you know, and they'll have a nice little team, and they're not going to be as good as they were this year. But the hope is that when maybe when he's a senior, then you know you come in and you have a couple of other East Pines under you. Yeah, for sure. All right, last so. guy for Tennessee. Uh, you want to do a quick hitter on Kyle Alexander? Yeah, also same kind of same thing. I, I, I'll put Kyle Alexander. I She's don't also She's know his eligibility okay. either, but, like, I mean, I, I really like his length. He fits the modern-day mold, but um, I, he – He's been in foul trouble a lot of the times I've seen him play. So um, that's definitely going to be something he has to clean up if he, cause if he gets if he gets put in as anything, it's going to be defensive upside, I would say. And uh, so he needs to be able to play without fouling. Um, but offensively, I mean, he's not much but catch and dunk, offensive rebound, you know. Uh, I don't know. What do you do? You have a better opinion on it than I mean? Do you have higher opinion on it? Cool. 
Hey, anybody there? Are we cut? So Kyle Alexander, Stand Up Canada, uh, 2024 Summer Olympic gold medal champions in basketball men's. Um, I don't think Kyle Alexander will be on the team. Uh, that, okay, so he's an older player. He should, um, every time I've seen them play, he's been in foul trouble. So that is a problem when the reason that somebody would take him, he fits the prototype of this rim running Clint Capella type uh, body type or whatever, and he's mature. And so, so people like mature players at the end at, in later rounds or as unsigned free agents. Um, a lot of times guys get ranked higher. I have Kyle Alexander at 265, but I mean, there's a ton of guys that aren't going to go pro ahead of him. Uh, but he, I mean, he's in foul trouble. He has defensive upside if he hasn't figured it out yet. The one thing is also, though, if they make a deep run in the tournament, they don't, uh, you know, the, uh, the people people look at that and then they see, oh, and, and, and usually when people see people make a deep run in the tournament, they're disappointed because that's the best you're going to see of them if they're, win if they're tearing shit up in the tournament. Pardon my French, if that's a, uh, it got a bit, Got to get bleep, but it's it's uh, it's, yeah. it's whatever. Yeah, yeah. But uh, my thing with uh, Alexander is he had a couple uh, in the uh, Louisville game. He had this one post turnaround J that uh, he got the shot up up and over just barely over this uh, average big man size, and it was like he could. I don't know if he can get enough lift to prevent himself from getting blocked on those at the NBA level. So that'll be that might be a problem for him generating offense. But he hit a short corner jumper, but it was weird because his hands were like his guy yeah. hand was ridiculously close to his shooting hand, and it was really off putting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's he's really there though as a catch and dunk re offensive rebound guy, you know, pick yeah. and roll guy. That's how he projects. That I so I think it's a little. It's a little, what I say, unfair kind of how we're judging him right now, I guess, because that's not at all how he'll play in the NBA because he'd be thrown in a million ball screens. If, oh, yeah. You know, so um, so he's kind of just playing this old Rick Barnes offense. So it's not really uh, it's not really tailored to him, but I. I mean, I don't think he's talented enough anyway. So if we're dropping him in the NBA to do pick and roll, then he's probably not going to be really successful at that right now either. I think, I mean, he could be, he could be easily be a guy you see have a long European career or, or be in the D league, D league call up. You never know with those guys, you know, um, you know, 6'11", 220 projected 7'3", wingspan, 9'2", standing. So, you know, I guess that I don't know. That's about all I got on him, but yeah, that's about it, honestly. Uh, yeah. All right. So before we end this, Richard had a question. He just want to know how you felt about some of the the top college scores. So one that's come on the surface as of late, I believe it was Kai Bowman. Yeah. So Kai is out of Boston College. Um, something they're doing with their guards there is working even though they suck as a team constantly, uh, it, that usually doesn't correlate. It seems a little ass backwards to, for college basketball. Usually when you have good guards, you're good, but Boston college still sucks, but I mean, they continue to put these first rounders and Kai is for real too. He's a little bit smaller than Jerome Robinson and Olivia Hamlin who came before him kind of as the Boston college guards, but he is like he he's going to be a instant offense kind of spark plug six man guy for you and maybe he can start if he uh, he but he's around six foot is is the big problem with him but he's got the athleticism to make up for it but you could see him as your Aaron Brooks type Nate Robinson type kind of guy coming off your bench he, you know he throws down mean in game dunks so. Um, yeah, and he's a good shooter too. I mean, he's, a, but I, I was not on the Olivier Hamlin bandwagon, but 
I ended up now at a point in life where I'm trusting Boston College with their guards. Even though, I mean, Olivia Hanlon hasn't been the greatest, but I do, I, I, I like the, the, uh, the things going forward for Jerome Robinson. I like that. So, Kai Bowman, I can tell you where I have him ranked preseason. I do that. Um, sure. It's fairly, it's, it's in the 70s, I believe. Um, a little bit lower. Oh, yeah, 86. So, but that's also below, like I said, that's that's an inflated number if you're going by 60 because a lot of those guys won't be going. Maybe not even Kai. All you right, Mov- moving on to uh, tie for third in the country. Uh, uh, this is the guy Richard Stamen would not be a big fan of, Carson Edwards. I'm a big fan of Carson Edwards. Um, I'm a Purdue dropout. Um, but I don't really have any allegiance to the school. I just, I, I, I love their program and Carson Edwards is yeah. one thing I'll say is say he, he, I, my projection for him in short is that I see him kind of being the same thing as Kai Bowman, um, maybe a little bit better, like Jamal Crawford type in the NBA, but he's proved like he's getting shots off. Look. And he's getting them off, and he's getting off NBA threes, and he's making them with with guys in his face. So um, being able to do that alone is enough to be able to sustain a career in the NBA for multiple, multiple years. For sure. All right, Bibbs, you got any final questions? Give me one more guy before we go. Uh, Dominator. Dominator? Dominator. Mike Dom. Oh, Mike Dom. Okay, so Mike Dom, I have ranked right at the end of the first round. Uh, where is he at? Dang it. Uh, uh, Isn't that? His, I've heard of. Yeah. Him on your so I, 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 I see him. No, he has a very. Listen, I said this. I, I, I never forget that I said this about Chandler Parsons. There will always be room for guys that are six ten or taller and can shoot. I have Mike Dom ranked thirty seventh preseason but he's damn seven damn near seven foot right and throw him as wingspan like seven two um and he can shoot the ball like and he can shoot a ball like i like i don't want to compare it like his game is dirt the game i he's not he doesn't obviously doesn't do it as efficiently as dirt obviously nobody does but like he is a dirt all the way down to it's impossible to black a shot. Like if he wants to get his shot off, he gets it off because of his high release. And, you know, if he, if it goes in or not is up to him or not, kind of like Dirk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes any sense. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because, like, we get – Every like every other year, it seems there's always the the next Dirk comparison, and us Dallas fans. Are oh, yeah, tired of it's it. a good comp. That's like a good poor man's Dirk is like a super good comp for him. It, it, it just matters, and and he'll get exposed pretty bad defensively. So I couldn't see him being more of like a role player, like like a Channing Fry even or something like that. If you don't if you don't want to compare him to a white guy, or if you want to compare, you know. You don't want to compare him to another white guy. I'll compare him to Channing Fry. I was going to think by Alitza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a little bit more fluid. Yeah, Channing Fry is stiff, but yeah, I I like Dom, and he'll play somewhere for a long time. Because, like I said, if you're six ten and can shoot, there is a place for you somewhere playing basketball. All right, and I think we should all ask this big question that's going to determine the future content uh how's the site reno going site renewal is going great we just got a we basically just got to flip a few switches we're waiting until after christmas and uh everybody's getting together with their family and then we're gonna all sit in front under the mistletoe uh, no i don't want to sit under the mistletoe with all the people that are working on the site that's kind of gross but we're all going to get together with our families and then we're going to get back and then conference season starts, man, there's matchups every night, guys. You could don't be lazy and just watch the tournament and think, you know, who's going to get drafted. 
Watch watch matchups during the year. They're all there's one on like every night. I wasn't yeah. talking to you guys. I was talking to the audience. Of course. <laughs> and with that, I think it's safe to say that we got everything we need to say. Sorry for the extremely extremely long podcast, but we had to. No, it's cool. I had fun. I got like my my family's inside. Where are you at? Where are you at? And I'm like I'm talking Mavericks basketball. I gotta address the, the crap too. Yeah, and my and my computer battery's about to die. I would probably talk longer. Yeah, for sure. Well, but yeah, no lock draft at lock draft on Twitter at lock draft Dougie uh, on Instagram lockdraft.com. Uh, yeah, lockdraft.com has still stuff up from last year, but it'll be up soon for in running talking about guys that you see on Sports Center now. Anyway. Lock draft podcast. Lock Draft Podcast. All you got to do is Google Google Lock Draft Podcast and the iTunes page will come right up. Click it. Subscribe. Give five five stars. Thumbs up to butt. Whatever. Whatever they do over there. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And And Max, look out for Max. Max Max is going to be doing scouting reports on the site once it gets up and running. So, yeah, I already have some in my inbox. They're just ready to get pinned right on the board once the site goes up. So yep. look out for Max. Look out for Max. Hey, if you if you want to buy 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 some of his scouting reports if you like them, holler at me. We'll work something out with them. Huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, I actually do have a couple on the, some of the guys we talked about today, including Ethan Happ. So that'll be interesting. All right. You can also find Mike Bibbins on Twitter at Bibbs and at Bibbs Corner and his website, bibbscorner.com. Also, Netflix content and NetflixLife.com. Bibbs, you got anything? Send us off. No. Bibbs? No. Yeah, it's all right. It it was cool getting with you, Bibbs. Maths, it's always cool getting with you. I'm gonna be on some more. I like this. I like I like maths hoops. I like these little niche team shows that I could get in depth with things because you know it's a wild world out there. There's a lot of stuff going on with everybody. So you could get anything you want about anybody. So yeah. holler at Max. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just Mavs, just to be yeah. honest. It's it's Mavs here. No. It's a lot of Mavs. It's all the third round draft picks like us. Oh yes, we're all the third, we're the, all the rejects. But I would have definitely yeah. been a third round draft pick. Definitely. Yeah, it's the greatest third round pick in Mavs history, Corny Thompson. Really? I don't even remember third round picks. I don't really know if he's the greatest, but I just I love the name, and he he yeah. won a title with Barcelona, so if that means anything. Really? But, yeah. yeah. I think they should go to more. But last hot take of the day, I think they should go to like three or four rounds now that they have. Uh, G League affiliation set, but holler at me on another day. Lock yeah. draft, uh, lock draft, uh, three uh, third round picks. Max, yeah, thanks and for having me on, guys. Much appreciated. Uh, final thing you could find me on Twitter at Rangers Team 669, obviously, content on lockdraft.com, and then also you got Maz Draft. Uh, at on Twitter and uh, Richard Stamen's website mazdraft.com and that's all we got for y'all this week. Can't wait to see y'all next week is gonna be a bit more focused and uh, but we had to make sure we got as much as we could today. So see y'all next week. Yeah. Peace. Listen to Max. Yep. <laughs> and Bibbs. Merry Christmas. All right, you want to move on to, we got the Dallas Mavericks, who are currently below 500 after the loss to the Warriors. Yeah. When I Harrison came for the, the Mavericks, the three J's, Jim Jackson, Jamal Mashburn, and Jason Kidd. I used to have the, the T-shirt. And J.J. Borea. <laughs> oh, no. That was the squad when they had, like, three straight top five picks, though. They, uh-huh, they, yeah. Yeah. And they got no, those so three far. guys, so. Anyways, Jamal Mashburn needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Not as a Maverick. Let me get that though. done for me. Yeah, not as a Maverick, but as like a Heat or Hornet. Yeah. But yeah.
That's where he started. The Mavs gave him his start. I, I see him. He, his son plays AAU. He was a senior this year. So he's going to be coming on draft boards next year. He's a, he's a little cold-hearted little dude. Anyways, Mavs. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I think I remember the problem with the, the, the three J's was Jim Jackson had beef whenever he got injured that like J- the, Jamal Mashburn and Jason Kidd were like actually winning games. And so he got pissed whenever he was trying to get himself inserted back in the lineup. And he yeah. was like, we don't need you. And then there's this whole fake beef about Tony Braxton that didn't actually exist, which resulted in a bunch of unnecessary drama. And ultimately yeah. it was just a big mess. Yeah. And, but one thing, one thing younger people don't know, like I'm, I guess I'm kind of becoming a little old school right now. Jamal Mashburn, he was the guy that really brought Kentucky back after, I, I know they actually had another short spell of mediocrity before Calipari, but they had a really short spell of a time they were on probation in the eighties for Matty Sutton and they transitioned to Rick Pitino. Who is going to win the Greece League with Panathiagos this year? I found a way to insert Rick Pitino. Uh-huh. Is so that, when is Rick Pitino came back, his first awesome recruit was Jamal Bashburn, who took him to multiple Final Fours, I think. I know he took him to one. But, I mean, that was that was the guy that was bringing him back. So, anyways. Yeah, for sure. Uh the weird thing was it was kind of iffy because like I was watching the Texas Tech Duke game and uh, Dick Vitale was like uh, he was like Brick Patino is like he really wants to do it but like he's still talking to his family about it and it's not confirmed yada yada I was like uh, is he actually going to do it or not I don't know yeah no, no I think he's going to do it they're, they're awesome I looked at their roster they got Nick Calathis who's like a, who's like basically you can so Panathiakos is the best team in Greece. They always are. Oh, yeah. They're always – so – and they have Nick Kalathis. They have uh, – ah, we went over the roster yesterday. But um, I know they have James Gist from Maryland. He's like the 12th guy on the bench. So they have uh, Adrian Payne. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Oh, they have Papa Giannis, uh, who just got picked in the lottery like two years ago by the Kings. So, Yeah. Yeah, anyway, moving Anyways, on. I, I had to holler at my boy Rick Pitino. I mean, I'm not his boy. Like, he wouldn't say I'm his boy, but, like, I'm super Rick Pitino fanboy. He's a basketball genius, and he needs to coach somewhere. And now he's in Greece. He can do whatever he wants. Uh, you know, strippers at his dorm. He's going to be in Europe. Don't matter. So... <laughs> So it appears uh, Payne played for Panathinaikos last year, but he was cut, and now he's playing in China. Oh, really? Oh. Go holler, Adrian Payne. That dude is a giant. He's one of the most giant people I've ever been around. He's way more giant in person than he is on TV. Speaking of Adrian Payne, Luka Doncic crossing him up and dunking all over the paint. <laughs> Moving on to Luka Doncic, why don't you give your piece on Luka Doncic, Dougie? Well, 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 I know some people had Luka Doncic ranked number one overall coming out of last year and would have taken him if they were the Suns. Uh, um, I was one of them. I don't know. I'm, I just want to be on record on all forums as saying that um, – he did a very incredible thing last year by what, what he did in Europe and what he like his whole thing, what we talked about, Eurobasket, winning Eurobasket as basically the second best player on the team, winning the Euro League, Turkish Airlines, Euro League. Uh, and he was the MVP. That's unheard of. And I mean, there's real grown men like Joey Dorsey and Epke Udo up in there. So I was always like that. And when it comes to the Mavs, a lot of people were worried because they picked Dennis Smith um, last year. And they said, oh, and and Luca projected as a point guard. But I think they were just kind of getting too quibbled up and who brings, like, it doesn't really matter who dribbles the ball up the floor. Like, you can, Dennis Smith is going to be a point guard that doesn't have necessarily so much offense run through him 
off on the ball. Luca, you can run off. It doesn't matter. They said they were going to play him at the four, I heard one time. And I said, okay, that's fine too. Whatever you want to call it, they're just going to run offense through him and he knows what to do with it. So, like, his basketball IQ is that, like, he's a 99 in 2K, like, already in basketball and in, in offensive IQ as a defender. I think I think what happens with him as a defender is somewhat physical limitations. Like he's a wizard with the ball on offense, but he can't kind of carry what he can do with the ball, which is what make him what what he does with the ball in his hands makes him is what makes him special. And you can't really carry that onto the defensive side, but it really it really doesn't matter when you're that special offensively. So that that was my thing. I I. I I have mad props from DeAndre Aiden and Marvin Bagley, who were number two and three I had ranked in that order. Doncic won, eight and two, Bagley three. Um, but, like, it, it really it really was hard to not put DeAndre Aiden number one. But I said, like, this is I, – I really think Luka Doncic is a generational player. Probably the first uh, – in the line of the Greek freak, first since the Greek freak, and then before him, Anthony Davis. All right, so I just want to say there's been this narrative about Luka Doncic as of late among the big national media, which sometimes says things are a little over traumatic. Do you think he's like in some strange sort of way or even more direct way, is he the second coming of Larry Bird? <laughs> um, Kind of. I mean, it, when you're coming from a place that, uh, like, it's almost the same thing kind of coming to the big city. Like I I'm from Indiana. So I know where Larry Bird came from, like his town and it is a cornfield and it's exactly what they say it is. It's nothing that I actually went, drove through there like a week before I came out to Arizona and I actually saw a milk crate, like just a milk crate basket on a wall somewhere while I was driving through the town. So, like, in the same kind of way, Slovenia, it might be because it was war-torn, but, like, he comes from a different place, and, and yeah, he's gifted offensively like Larry Bird. I don't know if he could ever become the shooter that Larry Bird was, but in today's different game, I mean, I think what people when people talk about Larry Bird, they think that he would be overmatched physically i think that's kind of the racial thing that they that you know like they think that he just wouldn't be big and strong enough but i'm like no he would kill it because he'd be shooting threes all day like so i think luca has that advantage to where if larry bird played today he would probably be shooting more threes you know he'd be shooting a million threes he'd be shooting 20 threes a game probably more than steph curry but um luca luca will be able to do that Probably less efficiently than Larry Bird would have, but we'll never know, kind of. <laughs> I mean, I don't know those step backs. Yeah, I'm, no, his step backs are nice. His, yeah, no, his step backs are nice, nice, nice. I don't I, like Larry Bird is just the best. Like Larry Bird and Steph Curry and everybody else. And then, I, I mean, I can say that Luka Doncic does things with the ball like Larry Bird does. Like that to me, that's what Luca is, is what he can do with the ball and making plays. It's that, I mean, he scores points and that's him making plays also, but like he's the kind of guy that brings a team and makes it a team. And he's, he's also going to be good wherever he plays. I don't want to say like LeBron, but like, like he's going to make everybody better around him. I'm not going to compare him to LeBron quite yet. Quite yet. Although, but, to be fair, LeBron is Luca's idol. Yeah. Oh, he is. Yeah, and he he put a lot of people don't notice he plays a lot like him. He's just not, you know, like two hundred and seventy five pounds of freaking muscle, you know. So, it, it, but his game is centered around kind of making the right basketball play, and he doesn't. I mean, if he could do it like this at nineteen, like, like, like I don't even know. It feels like he'll be like making shots like like trick shots in game like you know that trick shot guy that imitates everybody yeah like he'll be doing that in games like i don't know what i if he could do this at 19 so you know 
that's the way I feel about him. And he can only get better as a shooter. Like it's not, it's not like he's a bad shooter. He's actually a really good shooter, but he could be, if he could become a knockdown shooter, like he, he could make some efficiency records disappear. Like, so I think the world of Luka Doncic, and it's the only reason I had him ranked number one. Cause like I, I, I had really, really been on DeAndre Ayton as also being a generational kind of player, but I kind of soured on that late in the season last year and and kind of became, it was kind of as I was watching Luka Doncic take his victory tour. So, you know, <laughs> across Europe. Yeah, and then another crazy thing is he didn't just win the yearly MVP, he won the Spanish League MVP too, and then he hit that one-handed floater to to seal the game in uh, Game 4 versus Basconia. It was, it was No, crazy. you don't see guys his age. You do not see guys his age really get regular playing time, let alone be the star of a team, let alone be the star of the best team, let alone be the, you know, MVP of the whole entire league's championship tournament that is that you know and everything like that's that that doesn't happen those are like real bet like like Epke Udo is a lottery pick and that's who they put you know Bogdanovich that that there's three uh, Bogdanovich isn't a lottery pick but Jan Vesely is a lottery pick so that, I mean when they play Fenerbahce they play a front line of like two lottery picks and a mid first round pick when, you know, so that's not, I mean, he, he faces less than that when he goes into say Atlanta's paint, you know, that that's like a cakewalk for him. So. Yeah. I think another thing to know is not only did you know Fenerbahce have that those... Mike Mascala, if he's still there, is this Hey, black? give credit to Dwayne Dedman. Yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. Dwayne Dedman. Yeah. A yeah, dead but, man. <laughs> yeah, he he had some good years for the Spurs. But uh, uh the Fenerbahce, not only did they have those lottery yeah. picks, they also had Brett Wanam- Brad Wanamaker who's now on the Celtics. Oh yeah. He's he's warming the bench, but you know, he yeah. made he made Brett- a big impact in that finals game. Yeah, no, the, the Fenerbahce, uh, I'm my man Altai here in, in uh, Arizona. He loves Fenerbahce, Turkish basketball. Turk- Turkish basketball is on a revolution, kind of like a like a um, second, like a renaissance. They're, they're, they have a couple of good prospects coming out. Um, it it kind of started a little a couple of years ago with Cork Mats, and you know so. Turkey basketball, Turkey. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, you guys had a rough time and in, in a, not a rough time. I don't know. What do you think about the game last night? Uh, Luka Doncic plays well, scorches everybody. He had like three step back threes that he missed that were inches away from going in. And if that, if those ones had gone in, the Warriors crowd have all just dropped their jaws completely you had that you had that other moment where like he dived into the crowd and then he like gave the kid yeah. that he dove into this signed jersey which was nice and yeah. he uh he had a r- couple of really nice assists and yeah. he also the nice thing was you know we say his iq on uh defense isn't quite the same as Dolphins. offense but he still had a couple of times where he timed to, to pick off a pass in midair perfectly in the second half and that was really nice yeah. to see I wish oh, he had got it taken out in the fourth quarter. His instincts are good all over the place, and and it all usually centers around the ball, though. Really, he's a he's, he he is a good ball. Like he has awareness of where the ball is on defense. He just wants the damn thing in his hand, like you know. So like, what? Yeah, that 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 was the main thing that I I was getting at. I, I used to get upset about that when they were they were trying to say that he wasn't a good fit there because they just took Dennis Smith. But I said there's plenty of people to run offense through there, you know. And yeah. it turns out he's. I mean, Dennis Smith. Dennis Smith is kind of like a what a two guard is going to be. I mean, it doesn't really matter who brings the ball up the floor. Yeah, for sure. And to be honest with you, my thought process with picking a guy like Luca is. 
unless you have a guy that you seriously think is going to be better than Luca, you pick Luca because he's the better player. And like, it's not like necessarily always best player available. Like if you're the 76ers, you shouldn't be picking Ja. Right. But like if you're the 76ers, should you be picking Joel Embiid? Yeah. Should be picking well, Joel. But Embiid. I mean, should you be picking Zaire Smith though? You know what I'm saying? Like that 2021 that, that, pick though. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I understand where you're coming from on that, but I mean, you either make it, you're either making a pick for upside. I mean, they got enough picks where they can do whatever the hell they want. Like, so, I mean, if the, they could spend them either which way, they're going to get some guys that they think they can play now. And they're going to get some guys that I think are projects. And it, it's kind of just like a, a risk reward kind of analysis, basically. When you have that many picks, at least, if I, I, as far as the Sixers are concerned, now Dallas trading up to get Doncic is is what I consider a great move because, uh, look, Donnie got tipped off, right? That the that the Hawks are are like Trey Young. He knows they're not going to. He's not going to get picked till five, right? So it, it's a good move to. It's a good move. Just ditch the pick and go up and get your guy and. Mark Cuban, uh, one thing I want to say about the Mavs, I, I was talking about this on text with Max, is that I I wanted to call Mark Cuban the best owner in the league, but I stopped short of it the other night when I was texting with you, but I do think he is the best owner in the NBA. But I, I, I stopped short and I called him like a top three, right? So, Something like that. Yeah, so I but I I went back through and I think I I, I would rank him higher than theirs because he sees things in the bigger picture like that. He sees Luka Doncic just like Dirk. It's like like how could you not? How could you be so dumb not to see that? You know, and I I, I firmly believe that Mark Cuban made that pick kind of with with the with the kind of nudge from like from Donnie Nelson that this is the real deal and probably the rest of their scouting department too, you know? Yeah. Well, I think considering what happened with Giannis where Mark Cuban single-handedly overrode the selection of Donnie Nelson to pick Giannis in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I think he just gave up the reins on draft night to Donnie. Like he should have the whole time because yeah, Donnie knows I mean, what he's doing. Well, with, with what the tier system was in last year's draft, I mean, to, that's just the stand. I mean, he just gave up the standard, what you give up. And if you think that that guy is going to be that, I mean, they didn't give up hardly anything. And, and I am, I'm on record as not being a big Trey young guy. I don't hate him. He's, he's, I mean, some of the stuff he does is really amazing, but I don't, I just don't know what his, I, I don't really like his translation. So that made me even higher on the trade. Like, because I, th- I thought that th- that the Mavs were kind of getting over on the Hawks just because they knew that Trey Young wasn't going to be there. You know, I think that in a, in, a, in a vacuum, the Hawks probably could have got more for that, but they didn't. Because, yeah, for sure. You know. And uh, honestly, even if Luka got picked at two, I would have been a big fan if they still did the same trade and got Jaron. Because I'm a yeah. big Jaron Jackson fan. I I have this saying that I've said before is I yeah. had a love affair with Jaron Jackson, but my true my true love was always Luka Doncic. <laughs> <laughs> but Jaron, no, yeah. def- the affair was pretty strong towards the end. Like it was, it became a really tough decision, especially considering how they both fit really well into the Mavs. So like if they did yeah. the same trade for Jaron and we had Jaron right now, it would solve a lot of problems that are going to be questions about our center. But in exchange, we have the big question of who's going to score for us. Cause other than Dennis and Dennis is a big question mark right now. Uh-huh. Well, I was, I, I, that was, I wasn't as high and I'm still not like really sold that Jaron. Jack- I mean, I, I, I don't hate Jaron Jackson. He probably will end up, I just feel like he'll probably by the end of his career be a, end up exactly where I thought he I, I think I had him at seven or something or eight like that's what I think if you re, if you redraft in 10 years that that might be where he is I, I like he could end up at two I don't even know I, you know look at Donovan Mitchell a lot of redrafts that that could be different you know I, I mean I, I'm not I didn't have Donovan Mitchell in the top 10 so like I, I like Jaron Jackson's game I like I 
I don't know what it is. I just never got on board with it last year as much as as much as other people did. And I, and I mean, he went to Wallamere right down the road from me where I live. So um, and I, I've seen him for a long time and I don't hate him as a player. And I, I think he fits everything. And I think he fits exactly. Uh, I, I thought also he got put in a great spot in Memphis where they need to kind of have uh, the, remain their defensive they, they want to keep their roots as like kind of this defensive, like we were a defensive team, almost like the Ravens doing football, you know, and um, he, he can help you with that. It might not be the same way as they're used to, but he can also do some of the other things like shoot the three that they're going to need to do in Memphis to kind of move into the, to the uh, roaring twenties of NBA basketball. Yeah, I think my main thing was I remember seeing some flashes of him as a playmaker at Michigan yeah. State, and now he's expand he's expounded upon those flashes, and it's re- it's become an actual thing during certain phases of the game where Jaron Jackson's asked to uh, not like initiate initiate, but like run a little action of some offense here, or like he'll he can literally dribble up court and transition and finish and yeah. one. And it's like, oh my lord, he is six foot. He is six foot eleven, seven foot five wingspan doing this. And I think, yeah, the defense is incredible. The shooting isn't the world's greatest shooting right now, but like he's like everyone. Anyone saying that like he's a worse shooter than Mo Bamba isn't really looking at the numbers because he's taking over twice. His, his rate is over double that of Mo Bamba's, so it's right. just not really comparable. And I don't know. Just he's so young too. Like everything, just the, so many boxes are checked with him for me. Well, I'll piggyback on that too because I the the thing is is that if Mo Bamba is not in that draft, I have Jaron Jackson ranked like fourth, basically. I I'm um, but also I I think he's I know he's a better shooter than Mo Bamba. Um, but I what got me with him a little bit i think was just his shot and then how it looks funky i don't know man it's not really like a very scientific way of like maybe dropping a guy a spot or two on a board especially that high but his, his shot kind of worries me and it worried me at the free throw line um and i don't know there's some guys shots that are, are have hitches in them that that you think can work and you there's some guys that don't I think his work can work just fine. I think once he starts getting attacked with length, it might be harder to get off is one of the things that I thought about Jaron Jackson. I haven't really watched him intently enough to see if that's the case this year in his ability to get off threes. But um, that was it. And, and I just like, like Mo Bamba is, is, uh, is the ultimate combine king. So, I mean, I had to really put, if unless he bounced the basketball off his head when he tried to dribble, I, I kind of wanted to have Mo Bamba. I, I felt, I mean, I didn't feel beholden to it, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's Mo Bamba. He's, I mean, somebody's going to take him for his upside. Yeah, I know Lando did the squad that's addicted to length. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. You know, are. you got a wundu Isaac. Yeah, and Bamba on the. Same I like team. building your team that way. Milwaukee does the same thing. Yeah, but Milwaukee has a bit more. Yeah. They're not just build. They're not building their team on the basis of length as much as they're finding guys that are versatile and have skill sets and have size. Well, there. Look, Milwaukee is lucky that Giannis is a uh, is an effective enough playmaker because that's the real key. Is that. Orlando doesn't have anybody that is a playmaker that uh, Greek freak is. So they have all this length that they can only find one guy to throw a lob to him. And you would think it could be, it, w- it could have been Alfred Payton, but it just couldn't be. It wasn't meant to be. Yeah. I think uh, in Milwaukee throwing lobs, I think, I think Chris Milton could do a fine enough job throwing lobs to Giannis. They play, they have a pretty great two man game. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're fine. I mean, just, I mean, I, I was, I was very big on, uh, 
I probably would have took Bamba if I was the Magic this year, but I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have been mad at all if they took Colin Sexton. I thought that that would have been a reasonable pick. I think that's what I had in lock draft actually, my final lock draft. But I all had right. Bamba going ahead of him, so yeah. How would you feel about them taking Carter? Oh, the Bulls. No, if the Magic took Carter instead of Bob. I would have been good with that, too. I would, uh, that big pack, that little big pack of Jackson, Carter, that's what I'm saying about Jackson. Wouldn't be surprised if he was third. Wouldn't be surprised if he was tenth. You know, uh, like the, that big class. It, I I almost looked at it like an like a, a la carte, like kind of what do you want? What are you looking for? The, the Bulls, like Mo, for the Bulls, Mo Bamba was – the guy because you have a stretch in Laurie Markkinen that you're trying to get out, so you need a rim protector. Um, but they, I mean, they didn't feel strong enough to trade up for him. But they kind of got uh, a little bit of a different skill set that can kind of kind of protect the rim, like Wendell Carter. You know, so that little big pack of like Bamba, Carter, Jackson. Um, I mean, if you want to throw like. For a while, it had Mitchell Robinson and Brandon McCoy in it. Like, they, they were all kind of the same. And, like, some of them might end up being the same. Like, you might end up seeing a Mitchell Robinson have the same career as maybe a Carter. But I don't know. That's why our business is so frustrating, the draft business. We have to yeah. wait so long. Yeah, to be honest, for me, I've most patient person I, in the world. I've got this. I got a mindset about it, so that way I don't really like you have you have to worry about the future naturally because that's how the it's kind of the whole point. But yeah. at the same time, I I'm more worried about just trying to find as much as I can about as about every single player possible rather than trying to worry about like who who do I like the most and stuff because I'll figure out. Who I like, who I don't like, who no, no matter what, I just, I just want to find as much information as possible because the, for me, the thrill is the journey itself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, it's, and it's fun to watch people overreact. I love watching people overreact. That's like one of my favorite things in the world. I'm still, I, my, the first um, recruiting class that I ever ranked professionally for the Big East Basketball Report. I had Al Farouk Aminu number one, and I'm like still waiting for like the past couple of years when he had a couple of good games in the playoffs against the Warriors. So I guess he's gonna pop, and I realize he's only 25 years old. <laughs> like, so yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of Al Farouk Aminu personally. I am too. I am. I, I'm a I huge wish. Fan. I think he's underrated and underappreciated. I wish that the Mavericks could have found a way to keep yeah. him. It's kind of same situation as Jay Crowder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, he was that. That was a weird class. It was like Brandon Jennings, Drew Holiday. There, there's nobody from that class has ever. B, BJ Mullins was ranked number one at once, one point. So like, you know, there's never really a guy that came out of that class. I don't think that was like some kind of big time hot shot. Oh, Demar Derozan, that's the one. Yeah, you know, well, on the Spurs now. Yeah, you know. I had him ranked second actually too. I'm very proud of my first ever rankings that I ever made. Well, my first ever rankings technically are the 2018 draft, and I think they're working out decently well because I was a yeah. big fan of Luca and Jaron. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. my first my my first real draft rankings was Derrick Rose. So I don't know. My not real, not my first real ones, but my first ones that I ever had like put on record. So, yeah. All right, it's out all right. All right, to cap this off real quick, I'm going to lob this up to you. Dougie, who do you think the Mavs should pick in the second round this year? Well, okay, so I got a couple. I got, like, three guys here for you. Um, obviously, one thing they need to do, they have DeAndre Jordan finally. It took him four years to get here. They lost four years off his prime, right? So, I mean, he's here for now, but... You can really only expect him, and as we talked about, you know, these guys take four or five years to pop sometimes. So um, the first guy I had in mind was, um, ah, where'd he go? Um, the, oh, the first guy I had in mind, Dewan Hernandez from Miami. Uh, 
he um, changed his name from Dewan Hernandez to Dewan Huel, uh, and he is kind of that thing. I, I don't know if he'll come out now either. I th- he's a junior, but um, it's somebody to look at. It depends on uh, who the uh, or, uh, you know how the Hurricanes do this year. Um, another guy, Ethan Happ, Wisconsin. Um, you know, you're going to have to find somebody to protect the rim behind him. But, um, if you're looking for maybe somebody that can pop as maybe even kind of like a star or a third option, you know, um, Ethan Happ, he doesn't shoot the ball. I mean, I mean, I can give the scouting report on him. It's pretty basic. He does things like the YMCA in the gym. You know, uh, um, so, you know, he, he, he's got these little array of hook shots he's got. And, and I mean, he's probably going to be the Big Ten player of the year if Wisconsin's relevant at all. So um, Ethan Half is another guy. And where's the third guy I highlighted? Dang it. Oh, Moses Brown, UCLA. Now, I don't think he, Moses will come out if he is a not going to be a first round pick. With, that means maybe a guarantee. Uh, but I really like what Moses can do. And if he can learn under DeAndre Jordan, I think it would be perfect. It would be kind of a perfect thing. And, I mean, they could also sign a veteran to kind of actually play to the minutes instead of Moses playing the minutes because he's probably not really ready to play in the NBA. But he is seven foot one, two thirty five. I've seen listings of Moses Brown at seven two before. Um, is super wingspan, uh, super shot blocker, and like I said, a, a lot of comp, a lot of comp to DeAndre Jordan and what he does, and that's kind of what they're going to want their center to do for a long time. So that's kind of like my number one guy for them. Um, and then if you want to, me to throw in an in, international sleeper, uh, Felipe Dos Anjos, uh, big out of Brazil. Um, he plays. Um, in the Brazilian league, I believe, but he's seven foot two, seven foot three. He's like another just giant guy, but pretty skilled, um, can block shots. Obviously if you're seven foot three, you usually can block shots, but he's got a good little post game with hooks and little moves. So a couple guys with good post games, Ethan Happ, Felipe Dos Anjos, Moses Brown, more of a rim runner. Uh, yeah. So I know you were saying that uh, you you need a guy to help block shots behind Ethan Happ. The Mavs do have a guy in that. His name is Maxi Kleba, and it is an awesome. The Maxi Kleba revolution. Bibbs, why don't you speak on Maxi? I know you're the fan club president. Oh, Bibbs, no, no, this is that's no shade to Maxi. I don't want I don't want that to be Maxi be shade at Maxi and Kleba. No, no, I I didn't mean it that way. But go ahead, speak your piece. <laughs> <laughs> so with Maxi, it's it's kind of interesting for me because uh, some people want to be the center. Um, I'm not sure if I'm quite there. I definitely want him to start, but I kind of want it to be a fluid four or five situation with whoever he's playing with. Um, I think with that bench unit right now with Maxi and Dwight Powell, that's kind of how they play. Uh, they just got whoever is the best matchup for whoever they're playing is who guard to. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, I guess he's 6'11", but he looks smaller than he is. Uh, and I think he kind of needs space to really be a great uh, shot blocker. Versus, mm-hmm. like, back playing against Joel Embiid one-on-one, I don't think that's something that I'm trying to see uh, full-time. <laughs> but uh, I like that you're you're looking at big men in this upcoming draft. You, you confused me with Dewan Hewell at first with, that, the, with the, the other name. He was number three. I was going backwards. <laughs> But he's a guy that I kind of liked last year. He's kind of a, a athletic, uh, yeah. long guy, kind of maybe Brandon uh, Wright type player. Yeah, he could shoot. He definitely could shoot mid range. Right. So, but he's yeah, he's Brandon Wright with a little bit better jump shot, maybe. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen him this year, so I don't know how much he's grown. But uh, yeah. he's definitely somebody I have my eye on. So. Uh... 
Dougie, you were talking about uh, Moses Brown, and I just want to say DeAndre may not be the best teacher for Moses Brown because DeAndre's defense is a major issue, actually, on the Mavericks right now. Is it? Well, I, I, I disagree. I think he could teach him how to rebound. He's not oh, a very yeah, good sure. rebounder right now, so I would, uh, I would um, limit his teachings only to how to rebound. So Maxi Kleba could teach definitely him how to not how to shoot free throws. Hey, DeAndre's got Don, John just figured it out a little bit. He's figured out the cheat code. Oh, really? They don't. He's shooting, like, they don't over have to 70%. Take him off the floor? He's shooting really? over seventy percent. I did not know that. I wasn't watching the screens at all or anything last night. I didn't even see that. He did have a bad I had the sound time. off. I had the sound off. They probably well, talk about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, he had a bad. You might have just killed time. Moses Brown for me though. <laughs> uh, I mean, Moses Brown, he even, he's got the haircut even. He's got the same hair and everything. I saw him play in AAU. He's another surprisingly giant person. And, I mean, I guess you can't be surprisingly giant when you're 7'2", but he looks bigger than that and, like, lengthier than that, really. Yeah. If, if rebounding is a problem for him, I'm not sure if I'm going to like him whenever I do get Well, I'm, I'm actually in favor. So this is this is the thing with Dallas. Um, I'm actually in favor of them keeping Kleber. Is that a, how do you say his name? Kleba? Kleba. The e is silent. Kleber. Kleba. 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 Uh, the R is silent, though, right? Yeah, I just said it the wrong way. I'm I'm in favor of them keeping them because they he could probably be kept on the cheap, you know, and then the, and then Dwight Powell somebody is going to pay too much for once he becomes a free agent. So you know, uh, you re- what you're really looking for is to load up to be able to give Dennis Smith whatever he needs and Luca the max if he needs it when that time comes around. So, you know, the, the, this year for the Mavs, it's nice that they're winning. And if they could get in the playoffs and stuff, that's cool. But it's really, I mean, it's really a win already that they're kind of playing above average and cycling and they're able to cycle through the bad contract like Wes Matthews and, and whatnot. Like, so, so they can, when Luca really starts to hit his stride, you know, 23, 24, that, they, that they're ready to go, you know. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I'm a big proponent of trying to bring back Maxi and Dorian Finney-Smith because, like you said, 23, 24, those guys are going to be in their primes um, still. Like, they'll be on the back end of their primes yeah. of good veteran role players to have. On yeah, yeah, team. yeah. The, uh, Dwight Powell is going to be somebody that you're going to see get, like, fit, like the Kelly Olenek contract, and you're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> you know? Like, so, yeah. And, and that's cool, too. You know, that that's why you draft. That's why you stockpile like that. I mean, that's how uh, another person, the last thing I wanted to talk to about, because I, I was doing a little Mavs research, you know, like making sure I was up to date on a depth chart. Ray Spaulding is somebody that I love. Um, I, I don't know how much he plays or anything. I, I, I really, I, I, he probably sits in a suit, right? He's but, not playing at all. He's down in the G League. Um, yeah. But he's been putting up consistent numbers down there. And that's yeah, really I like. I like I like seeing him on the depth chart for them. Like it, he he can kind of fit that mold too. Like Dwight Powell, like he could step in and be Dwight Powell. Like Dwight Powell was playing in the in the G League, you know, a few seasons back. And that's kind of what you're. That's basically what you're trying to do now in the draft. Now that you have a Triple A system, basically. So, um, race balling. Great balling will be able to great rim running kind. He, get, he he's gonna get muscle. He's way undersized than that. I mean Moses Brown just a bigger race balling. That's all. Interesting. Yeah. I'll definitely um, have to check out UCLA soon. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fun. They got a lot of prospects. They got they got like six or seven prospects on their team. It's fun to watch their games and kind of make sense of it all. Right. But Jalen Hands, you, you never know. You could walk away and Jalen Hands could be like number seventh ranked player on your UCLA board, or you could be like this dude's a top five pick. Right. Yeah. I didn't like him last year. I was glad he definitely decided to go back. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely got the talent, but I don't know. I don't know how can, I mean, he's got to have, 
the thing is, he just has to have a consistent year. He's going to have the starting point guard job there for the rest of the time he wants it. So he's got to have a consistent year where he shoots the ball well and and doesn't you know doesn't turn it over too much. So yeah. All right. So uh, a couple other things we just talked about before the podcast. Number one. We were talking about how the Mavs could potentially be in a position to select Goga Badadze if he somehow falls to the second round. How would you feel about that, Dougie? I'd be fine with that because I think he's going to get picked in the first round. He's one of my, like, he's in, like, the top three or four guys I have as draft and stash possibilities. Like, I, I, I don't really like to project draft and stash. Like, I just say this seems like a spot where somebody's going to draft and stash. And... You know, they just sort it out later. But I, he's like basically one of my top four guys drafted and stash, and he could even possibly play next year. I don't know what his situation is, but um, I mean, if you could get him there, that's fine. Yeah. Um, there, there's a couple. Of, like I said, I said Felipe Dos Anjos. If Goga's there, I would look, much rather have Goga over Felipe Dos Anjos. And I mean, there's a couple, couple of hero guys, but. I was kind of focusing on bigs, but yeah, I like him. Amid Nua is another Euro guy. Keep an eye on. Uh, Davidis Servitas? Yeah, Servitas. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it's really weird with the European guys. It's, I mean, unless you hear Luka Doncic, literally, like, you'll come to the end of the draft cycle, and it'll be, it like, there'll be five guys you've never heard of that are all, all of a sudden popping up in these different mock drafts. And I'm like, you know, right. so, so, I mean, it, I like to kind of go with guys that I know William McDowell White, I have up there, um, you know, like I, I, I like to start the season with guys I know. And then if, if, if somebody pops up, yeah, I always get the little Euro pass, the TV pass. Turkey yeah. Airlines. Turkish Airlines Zero League. Yeah. So but, uh, I mean, yeah, I I I like Goga. I mean, he he's got the skill set that, that that you need. I don't know. I don't, I'd like that. I'd like to see him become a better defender. I don't know. I I really haven't watched like giant clips of games of him, but I can. I mean, I can tell what it is right now. He's a little slow footed defensively. <laughs> He might be hard to keep on the floor right now, but as a draft and stash, I have him as a top three just by his skill set. A lot of people that are really high on him are really big fans of his defensive positioning and his rotations. Yeah, um, what that's I'm what I'm saying. saying. Like, it, it, it could be, like, it could be a lot. There, there's a lot of holes in his game that I don't know in particularly. I don't know. I, it, it could be his rebounding. I haven't, like I said, I haven't watched extended tape on him. Super extended tape. I've watched like a half here and there, half here and there, and it's hard to get him when they're on their team because they don't play that much. So you really have to get in where you fit in and kind of take like really yeah, highlight tapes are really showing almost all people's playing time right now. So, I mean, uh, Goga, he just, I mean, he's got that little face-up game, too. I'm not really familiar with how well he shoots from the line. That's probably pretty important also. Yeah. One thing I've been hearing is that he's been playing, like, more this season. Like, he's playing 25 minutes a game in the ABBA, in the in the Adriatic League, and he's, like, putting yeah. buckets. Yeah, I saw his minutes went up a lot, yeah. His playing time went up a lot, so I haven't really got into into my Euro League subscription yet. Other people use it all the time, but I haven't got into it. I probably should watch it more, but I'm going to start getting into it here after I get off vacation. It's a good time while there's no games. Yeah, for sure. I'll be watching NBA, but I can watch. I oh, I could have little double headers NBA on my on my TV and Euro League on my computer. Ha-ha. Thumbs up the butt, whatever. Whatever yeah, they sure. do over there. All yeah. right. Yeah. And, and Max, look out for Max. Max, Max is going to be doing scouting reports on the site once it gets up and running. So, yeah, I already have some in my inbox. They're just ready to get pinned right on the board once the site goes up. So, yep. look out for Max. 
if you agree. Why, I, hey, if you if you want to buy uh, buy buy some of his re- scouting reports, if you like them, holler at me. We'll work something out with them. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, I actually do have a couple of some of the guys we talked about today, including Ethan Happ. So yeah, that'll be interesting. <laughs> All right. You can also find Mike Bibbins on Twitter at mbibs and at Bibbs Corner and website bibbscorner.com. Also, Netflix content at netflixlife.com. Bibbs, you got anything? Send us off. No. Bibbs? No. Yeah, it's all right. It, it was cool getting with you, Bibbs. Uh, Matt, it's always cool getting with you. I'm gonna be on some more. I like this. I like I like Matt's hoops. I like these little niche team shows that I could get in depth with things because you know it's a wild world out there. There's a lot of stuff going on with everybody. So you could get anything you want about anybody. So yeah. holler at Max. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just Mavs, just to be yeah. honest. It's it's Mavs here. No. It's a lot of Mavs. It's all the third round draft picks like us. Oh yes, we're all the third, we're the, all the rejects. But I would have definitely yeah. been a third round draft pick. Definitely. Yeah, sp- the greatest third round pick in Mavs history, Corny Thompson. Really? I don't even remember third round picks. I don't really know if he's the greatest, but I just I love the name, and he he yeah. won a title with Barcelona, so if that means anything. Really? But, yeah. yeah. I think they should go to more. But last hot take of the day, I think they should go to like three or four rounds now that they have. Uh, G League affiliation set, but holler at me on another day. Lock draft, yeah. uh, lock draft, uh, three uh, third round picks. Max, yeah, thanks and for having me on, guys. Much appreciated. Uh, final thing you can find me on Twitter at Rangers Team 669, obviously, content on lockdraft.com, and then also you got Maz Draft. Uh, at, on Twitter and uh, Richard Stamen's website, mazdraft.com. And that's all we got for y'all this week. Can't wait to see y'all next week. It's going to be a bit more focused, and uh, but we had to make sure we got as much as we could today. So see y'all next week. Yeah. Peace. Listen to Max. Yep. <laughs> and Bibbs. Merry Christmas.